So we're going to begin, and people walking in will wonder what is going on. But uh, happy Thanksgiving uh, weekend, Sunday. Um, and if you are visiting with us, welcome. Um, some of you, um, this is your home church and your way for the year, and so you might be going, who am I? My name is Mike, um, one of the pastors here, part of the team, and uh, it's great that we get to celebrate what God is doing um, here in Penticton and here in the church. And so this morning, um, I, I was, I mean, we actually do it's interesting in our family around our dinner table, every, every dinner time after dinner we do gratitudes. And so every, everybody around the table gets the privilege of sharing three things they're thankful for. Um, some don't see it as a privilege, um, but everyone gets the opportunity to express what they're thankful for. And it is amazing how being thankful actually transforms your outlook on life even when you've had a really bad day. And so I just wanted to encourage everyone, on this Thanksgiving weekend, it could be, and there are really hard situations that are going on in life, but there is always something that we can be thankful for. And so the encouragement is to look at those things and to vocalize them and to share them with, um, with people and just to be able to point them out, and it's really amazing. And so, again, my kids, one who's sitting here, I'm sure he's really thankful he gets to do this again this evening. Um, but it is actually a really good thing to see what God is doing and to point it out and to be thankful. So this morning, um, we are in Mark 4, um, chapters 1 to 20. So if you have your Bibles, cell phones, tablets, um, if you can turn there, that would be great. And this is the first official parable that Jesus spoke in the Bible. We know that he did speak in parables in chapter 3. It does say that he spoke in parables, but this is the the first official one as it is. And this morning, um, we want to look at this, this parable in two ways. So we want to look at, as we evangelize and share and, and cast seed out, what is the ground it's going on? But honestly, we want to look at our own soil, and we want to look at our own ground in our own life and see if what God is trying to plant in us is actually being planted, which are good questions. And so this morning, that is what we're looking at. So Mark chapter 4, let's read it out together. It will be up on the screen as well. Um, and then we're going to dig into a few things here. So again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that had gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and withered, and they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up grew and produced the crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears, let them hear. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parable. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away, takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seeds sown on the rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. 
It's a very interesting story. And I think a lot of us, um, we would just look at it and go, that makes sense. <laughs> I get it. Um, and so as I was looking at this, things started coming up, and I was like, oh, you want me to deal with this in my own life. <laughs> and so just before we get into this, so last week we were looking at Mark chapter 2, um, the paralytic man that was brought through the hole in, in the roof, dropped at the feet of Jesus. And so from that, that story up to now, what has happened? So a little bit, look, so because we're not doing every story in Mark, so we're just going to little catch up where we are and then keep moving. So um, Jesus demonstrates that he has authority on earth to forgive sins and heal and cast out demons. That was Mark 2. And some major statements that Jesus made, um, you know, in his conversation in Levi's house, um, he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come for the sinners. Um, in Mark 2.27, Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. He had quite a conversation with these guys. He said, I'm Lord over the Sabbath. In Mark 3, 1 to 6, he healed a man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath, and the religious people were not happy with him. They were very unhappy. And Jesus was vocal and distressed about their stubborn hearts, which is actually quite key when you start looking how Jesus speaks to people throughout his time. He's very frustrated with their stubborn hearts. In Mark 3, 7 to 12, the crowds followed him. He healed people. Um, demons knew who he was. It was really interesting because it seemed like the demons he encountered actually knew who he was more than the people actually did. And on a regular basis, Jesus would tell the demons to be quiet. The demons understood who he was, and a lot of people didn't. And so that was, and then in Mark 3, 13 and 19, he called and appointed the 12 disciples, the apostles, come and follow me, this mountain, this mountain top, mountainside experience. Um, and we all need those experiences. If you've never had this moment on a mountaintop with Jesus, I would say, let's go on a journey together, because they are needed in our lives. In uh, Mark 3, 20 to 34, Jesus is really popular. He is like the hit going on. Um, and his family tries to take charge of him because they're like, everything's getting out of control. We need to go like reel this guy in. The Pharisees come, the teachers come, and they try to, to kind of ground him and bring him back. Um, and they try to denounce him in Mark 3, 22. They're saying, you are casting out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus unpacks a story with them um, about a strong man. And if you want to take over somebody's house, you need to first tie up the strong man. And this parable there, and so that is a quick little run-up to where we are this morning. There's been a lot. It, was, it would have been really exciting to hang out with Jesus. And we come to our passage this morning, um, and Jesus, the crowd is around, so he decides, I need to go sit in a boat. So they had a boat. He pushes off, which is actually a great way to teach um, the nice sea air, it would be an enjoyable, probably a little slope up from the water. Um, everyone's in front of you. I just thought of an interesting thing. I actually worked in a church where we met in the round in a circle. And so you would, somebody's laughing. <laughs> I didn't know it was that funny, but <laughs> okay. Um, but it really, you really had to get your head right because there were people sitting all the way around you while you were speaking. So you'd be like, turning around constantly. It was a different, and you worship in the circle, so you're staring at people worshiping Jesus, which um, you really want to fix your eyes on Jesus. So it works better. But anyway, so Jesus was teaching in a boat on the water's edge, and in verse 2, he taught, he taught many things in parables. And so what is a parable? That's the question, and it's a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. Um, and the Greek word, it, it means to compare. It's, a, it's um, an analogy. It's a story, a practical story to unpack a spiritual principle. And so when, as we look at the story, the parable today, who, who are the actors or who are in, who's in this story? So who is the farmer in this story? Do we have any Bible school students here? Who goes to CBC? Clive, are you home? They're picking on him. No. Who's the farmer in the story? Okay, Jesus. Okay, and, and what is he sowing? The word. Okay, perfect. So we're all in. And who else is involved? What are the other people in the story? There's four of them, four types of people. 
the ground. What are they? We're just seeing if people read. Retention, reading retention. So, thorns, we've got some Rockies, path. Yeah, and good soil. Okay, we're all in the same place. It's interesting what Jesus said about his word. Um, Jesus is teaching to the multitudes, um, and his words come from the Father. It was not his own initiative. In John 636, 63, Jesus himself said, following his words, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And in Matthew 24, 35, it's recorded that he said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So when we accept the word that he wants to plant in us, it does not pass away. It is for us. And so Jesus told parables because he wanted to change lives with truth. He wanted people to understand and see how their lives could be changed by applying everyday truth. He took spiritual principles and made them understandable to the audience that he was sitting around. He was really good at using the environment to convey the truth and point towards his father. So I think it's pretty interesting. He's probably sitting there and he goes, hey, let me tell you a story about soil. And he's probably pointing somewhere and going, see those guys up on the hill throwing seed? Let me tell you about the kingdom and, and they go, oh, that's the example. Like, he was using everyday examples to convey his father. This story is more about the soil than it actually is the sower. It's actually more about the soil than it is the seed. And so it's probably worth for us to actually look at the soil, us. Um, and just before we dig into a couple things, so if, you, if we quickly look at verse 13, it's, it's pretty interesting how Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any parable? And I go, oh, there's probably something for us to look into here. If we don't understand this, it will be very difficult to understand all the other ones that he's teaching. So imagine, so we have the scripture, and we can read all these other parables, go back and forth, but imagine sitting there listening, going, man, if I don't understand this one, I have no idea what else is coming, but I better understand this one so I can understand everything else coming. And so we are in the same place going, hey, I want to understand what Jesus has for us here so that I can actually have whatever else is coming planted in my life in the fullness that Jesus wants to plant it in me. So let's look at this. So in verse 3, um, I love the beginning. He just says, listen. <laughs> There's not many times Jesus actually says, listen. And so when he says, listen, I think it's probably worth it to have a listen. It's, it's worth it. Anytime you see these, these type of words in Scripture where he says, listen, you go, oh, I should probably pay attention. And so the words of Christ, they demand attention. They most certainly do. And so this is kind of how this story happened. So he's sitting there, um, and he's sharing, and he's probably acting. He goes, hey, you just throw seed out. It lands on the path. Birds eat it up. It makes sense. The rocky places, there's not enough soil. It grows. The plant goes away. The thorns choke it out, and then there's good soil. And then in verse 9, Jesus makes this statement, and he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And most of the people sitting there would have had ears majority of them. We all have ears here, most of us. And so my question is, let them hear what? What are we supposed to hear? What are you invited to hear in this parable? What are you being invited to hear from God? And so I just thought, you know what? What are we invited to hear? Let's take a minute and ask. I'm going to share some things, but okay, God, what are you inviting me to hear in this parable this morning. And so let's just take, we're just gonna invite Jesus to speak and say, God, I actually wanna hear from you. Let's take a minute. And so God, we just wanna sit and uh, be willing to hear what you have to say to us this morning. As you did those years ago, Jesus, you said, those who have ears, let them hear. We want to hear from you.
So as we, as we move on, we all have opportunities to actually share what Jesus has said to us, because I think he wants us to hear things this morning. In verse 10, it says, when Jesus was alone, which I have no idea how Jesus got alone, but he pushed everyone out of the boat, or how does he get alone when he is doing what he is doing? Who would actually leave him alone? Well, he was alone, and the disciples and others come up and ask for clarity about what he had just shared. And his response to them in verse 11, he said, um, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So this is not just a story about gardening. This is the secret to the kingdom of God. And it would be wise to pay attention. And in verse 12 it says, So that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. And this parable is about the kingdom of heaven and the secret that's been given to you. And it sounds a little bit harsh, those verses. Well, that's not very kind. (laughs) Jesus, don't you want everyone to understand you? It sounds a little bit harsh. But not everyone there was spiritually prepared to hear and understand, embrace Jesus' message. And it is clear from his regular interactions, conversations with scribes and teachers of the law, that they weren't ready to accept what Jesus was saying. It was very clear. Their soil was not prepared to accept what he was actually wanting to invest and plant in their life. Lots of people heard and encountered Jesus. Tons of people saw things and they walked away unchanged. They weren't prepared. They weren't willing to accept Jesus. You know, and so as we read 11 and 12, it does seem a little bit harsh. Like people are being removed. And is it true? Uh, Yes and no. He's not trying to exclude the whole crowd, but is weeding out, seeing whose lack of interest leads to the refusal to really hear and to try to understand. Their response and our response, to be honest, when we read Scripture reveals our hearts, and are they like the hardened path? And does the word that Jesus want to plant in our life, can it penetrate the ground? Can it go into the ground? He goes, this is the secret to the kingdom of heaven. He goes, "You, you need to understand, I want to invest, I want to plant things into your life so that you can live different here and now. In, um, Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, they said they perished because they refused to love the truth and be saved. The parables are not meant to obscure the truth, but rather to stir and develop a hunger for their meaning so that those who truly hear will seek God the Father, and today they'll seek Jesus. That's the point of it. That we wouldn't hear a story and go, well, that was really cool, but it would actually make me go, I want to know more. I want more. And you would be one of those ones who would go up to Jesus and go, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this? I don't get it. It's what we all ask our kids to do when they go to school. If you have a question, put up your hand and ask. Don't be scared. It's it's what we should be doing with Jesus. I have a question, Jesus. (laughs) And here I come. This parable is recorded in, um, in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Matthew unpacks this verse a little bit more. In Matthew 13, 13 to 15, he says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because well they do not see, and well hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. So this wasn't something random that Jesus said. He was actually quoting something from Isaiah when he made this statement. Uh. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. And so this this came from Isaiah 6. Um, verse 9 and 10, is where this passage actually came from. And this is quoted in each of the Gospels, and Paul quotes it once 
in Acts 28 as well. And it is completely in reference to a Jewish audience that will not accept Jesus. And I go, oh, there's something here I need to plant in my ground. I want to accept everything about Jesus. And so it's it's an interesting, so Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, the, the text quoted is five times it's found in the New Testament, as I said, in all the Gospels, and it is in direct correlation to Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. That's what it's correlating. And so Jesus is sitting there looking again, going, people are going to reject me, and I'm going to speak in such a way. And I was reading some things that was interesting. Some people said, man, Isaiah really didn't have a great ministry. I said, man, the guy was amazing. Yeah, he didn't have a great ministry, say, like Jonah, when Jonah went to a city and would speak, and the whole city got saved. Isaiah was bringing judgment and painful things and lived alone and what a horrible way to follow Jesus but he did what he was invited to do likewise Jesus was rejected by the people he was rejected until in John 12 I think it's John 12 32 says all men were drawn unto him when he was lifted up on the cross then everybody came to him but while he was on earth nobody came to him or not a lot of people they rejected him they couldn't embrace it And so he was saying, you need to change the soil of your life so you can actually embrace what I'm wanting to plant in your life. That's a hard word. You know, and I love that when these these people, the disciples and others, came to him, so Jesus didn't only answer why he spoke in parables, but he unpacks the parable with them and reshares it in terms that are easily understood. And then presents them opportunities to listen, to change, and to grow. And in John 10, 10, it says, I have come that you would know life and life to the fullest. This is why Jesus is speaking, that we'd know life to the fullest. I would love it. I want the fullness of life from Jesus. I think we all do. But can my, is my soil of my soul able to take what Jesus is wanting to plant in it? You know, and again, I was looking, going, if I don't get this parable, how will I get the other ones? And so um, this made me think about moving here and how long it took. (laughs) It took a long time, not the seven, seven and chunk months of the conversation here of what God was doing beforehand, going, I'm going to start working your soil so I can plant what needs to be planted in your life. So in the right season, it will actually grow. And so I remember the first conversation my wife and I had about moving here, and there's no way that seed was going in the ground. It just wasn't. And it took, it took a lot of tilling. It took a lot of tilling and moving some rocks. So that that seed could actually plant and germinate and grow. You know, and if, I, if you look at what the disciples went through in their life, um, they needed their hearts to be turned in every aspect towards Jesus because the journey they were invited into was not always pleasant. And they needed to be first and foremost The the ground, the soil of their soul is ready for anything Jesus wants to put in it because that will be the sustaining power for them to get through life. And it didn't end well for a whole lot of them. Well, maybe it did, actually. It ended really well for them. They went out as men of faith. Their bodies maybe didn't end well for them. But their spirits were alive. So the farmer sows the word in verse 15 And some of the people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. It's a horrible situation. I've witnessed it. I've watched it. The word is taken. In verse 16, others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble, persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word, but other things come in and choke it and make it unfruitful. 
Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word and accept it and produce a crop some 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. And so my question is, what does your soil look like? The soil of your soul. What does your heart look like? And I've had to look at it, and it made me think over quite a couple decades of the change that's happened in my life and, and letting God do what only God can do. My son Solomon, the three-year-old, he, um, he loves machinery. <laughs> he loves it. I actually used to drive bulldozer for a living, like D9Ns and big ones. And, and we love watching when they, they drop a ripper in the ground behind an excavator, and they just cut this swath in unusable ground so that they can make it usable again. And I, and I was thinking about it. I was like, man, that's a lot of work. But it's so worth it. And, you know, and I was thinking about the times I worked at summer camp as a kid, and we had horses, and so often we'd have to go out and pick rocks so the horses didn't step on them in the corral, and we're rock picking. It was a ton of work, but it actually was very needed. (laughs) You know, in life. And the words, and I love it, the words of Jesus here in the first eight verses, um, the farmer went out to sow his seed, and it just fell on the ground. And the words in the back end of the parable are, he wants to sow it into you. It's not just the scattering. I really think there are times we just scatter seed, but I, I specifically think there are seeds that God wants to plant in people's lives specifically for you. And I go, I want my soil to be ready to receive that word. Those seeds. And when we look at these four paths, or these four grounds, sorry, the path, it says, as soon as you hear the word, Satan came and took it. In rocky places, it says, as soon as you hear the word, and then in the thorny ground, as soon as you hear the word, but lives worry. And then the last one, it says, the good soil, it says, seed sown on good soil, hear the word and accept it. And there's a huge difference between hearing the word and accepting the word. It's a miles apart. A lot of us hear all sorts of things, but do we actually accept it and let it transform our lives? And so, where's Lauren? Lauren's got to be hiding somewhere out there. He's not hiding. Where is he? Classic. <laughs> Classic. Well done. Well done, Lauren. So. Huh? What do I need? <laughs> oh, Janine. Oh, yeah, where's Janine? Sorry, you're up. Awesome, Janine. Come and play the piano. That was awesome. Well done, Jocelyn. <laughs> Come and... Um, you know, and so it, it just really, like, I don't think... This is about the kingdom of heaven, about the investment that God wants to make into our life. And he's going, what does your soil look like? So it's great, and I think a lot of us, we are, we're called to actually share the word. And this is actually really helpful when, when we go out and want to communicate Jesus with people. Because sometimes you go, man, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Well, we're throwing seed on the path. Or we're throwing it among thorns and it's being choked out. So it actually helps us identify why sometimes when we're out sharing, maybe things aren't happening. We go, okay, wait a minute here. How do I actually help in these situations to actually go into this? The flip side of it is look at your own life and go, what does the soil of my own life look like right now? Is it a path? And the seed of God is just falling and it's not penetrating. Is, are, there, are there rocks <laughs> that need to be picked out. The thorns that, I, and it's such a, it's a bit of a graphic illustration. The thorns choke out the seed. And I go, oh. They choke it out, and people feel as though, I just can't do this, I'm being choked out. And I said, the, the weeds of life. You know, and so this morning, um, I think it's, a, it's, it's the right place to start as we go, man, we long to experience so much of what Jesus is doing and wants to do, but I long to have a soil and a foundation that can accept it. And so for years, I've been praying for a move of God, and I've, I've been blessed to be in, sit- in um, situations and opportunities to see different things, but over the last like seven weeks, it's changed. I'm like, 
I'm, I'm rethinking, just praying through, going, okay, God, like, what would this do for a church? How, how can we be ready to accept what you want to do? You know, and I did think, like, imagine if everything, all the crazy 22-year-old prayers that I prayed actually came true right now. I'd be done. I don't know if I could handle it. So I'm going, God, help my soil to be ready for the, for the investment and what you want to plant in it. And I would say that to you. What does your soil look like? And I, w- I was reminded of um, when Hart was speaking in Hebrews, you were talking about running the race. And I, I love the one phrase you said. It said, it doesn't matter how old you are, the race just changes. Or you, you use that, something like that. You said, I remember it, because I sit there and I listen, and I take notes. Um, on my phone, I take notes. But that's what you said. You said, your race, it just looks different. It changes, but you're still called to run. And so this, it doesn't matter on your age about this. This is going, God, I still want my heart to be tender and ready for what you want to plant in it for this season at this time so the right fruit can grow and we can have, we can, we can have the 30, 60, 100% multiply of what we're going after. And so how we want to end, I think this is um, challenging to me because we all, we all have the opportunity to deal with things in our life. Some of them we've just shoved in the corner for a while and we go, oh, I don't, that rock piling, I'll leave it alone. I'm functioning really well at 90%, that 10%. And I said, ah, let's go and clear the field. It's a bunch of work. And so, but I think the work is worth it because Jesus said, if you don't get this, you won't get anything. And I go, I want everything. (laughs) So I'm willing to do the work. And so this morning, um, we want to we wanna end with communion, but this is what I'm going to ask you. Um, if you can just get it and maybe just go back to your seat and just personally just look at your own life. Look at your own soul. Just in light of this passage, we read it. We know who the, we know the actors are. Nobody needs to tell you where you're at in this. We all can look. And, and then we're just gonna, we'll take communion together, and then if you are needing prayer, which, welcome to life. We're all human. We all need Jesus to touch our frail clay bodies. Let's pray for each other. And let's invite God to come do the work that only he can do. Literally, only he can do it. And I've had some transforming work in my life. Deliverance, where I, could, I was stuck and outside of Jesus. And so I'm, we need this. And so why don't we, um, if you're able, why don't we just stand up and we're just going to pray and then just go grab communion and maybe just go back to your seat and just take a moment on your own and then we'll take communion um, together and then we just want to pray for each other. So Jesus, we are willing to look at our own life and what you want to do in our life. And if things are standing in the way of what you want to do, God, we want to move them. We want to move those things so that our soil can receive what you want to plant in it, the good seed that that penetrates and changes lives. Let's just take communion and go back to your seat and just take a minute personally to think about this, and then we are going to take communion together, and then we'll pray together. And so this morning, if um, if you find yourself in one of one of these places, and I really think it was last night my wife and I were talking and this word accept it came up. They, everyone hears the word. But we want to accept it and have it change our lives. And so this morning, if, you are, if you're wanting prayer, if you're going, man, these are things going on in my life and I'm wanting rocks gone or being choked out or I need somebody to come and till my soil, so let's, Let's invite Jesus to come and do that.
And so we have, um, we have some people who would love to pray for you. So if some home group leaders or wherever the staff are here. If, and we just want to pray for people. Lay hands on you and do what Jesus said and just bless you and ask for him to come and touch your life.